Good afternoon. Hello and welcome to the Australian Intercultural Society Luncheon. My name is Ahmed Keskin. I am the Executive Director of the Australian Intercultural Society and I'll be your moderator for today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Australian Intercultural Society is an organisation that tries to promote cross-cultural understanding, information awareness, and uh, these are one of the programs that we believe are a great platform for that type of engagement, uh, awareness, seeking information from one another and get to see um, that there are more commonalities than one another. And also have some thought-provoking um, sessions which will challenge us, uh, enlighten us and give us some insight into some success stories and today's going to be an example of that. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as a traditional custodians of the land upon which we stand and pay my respects to elders both past, present and future. I'd also like to mention that if anyone wishes to tweet about this event, um, we, you can use the Twitter handle and hashtag that's on the, on the top right of the, of the screen, Ausin Society or, and or AIS Lectures. And if I could just kindly ask you to put your mobile phones to silent. Today's topic is uh, quite interesting in the sense that we have a unique case study in Australia. The age-old argument about mass learning compared to spaced learning continues to linger. That is, if learning if learning were to be spread out over a longer time frame, there may be better knowledge retention and capacity and better knowledge retention and capacity for using that knowledge, <coughs> such as the uh, space learning, which is the conventional means of, of teaching, compared to when knowledge is blocked or taught in a blocked manner, which is that massed learning. This may not necessarily be the case, as we know every individual has different learning styles. A one-size-fits-all model may be leaving behind those who can't adapt to the spaced learning method and hence enter VU's vision in providing an alternative and adopting this block model. Victoria University has called it the first year model as, uh, as per the name, they've applied it to their first year students and the model has become quite successful that they will be now applying it to uh, other year's students. And this model is one of the biggest student-centred, <laughs> staff-led, and community integrated transformation programs ever undertaken in higher education in Australia. It has been recognised by many uh, award providers, of which one is the International Education Association of Australia, as it took out their 2018 Award for Innovation, an award that recognised the work of an individual or team that has contributed to international education through an inno innovative initiative in an area including, but not restricted to, international development, internalisation of the curriculum, marketing and communication, support programs for international students, pathway initiatives, mobility programs or social inclusion activities. Its implementation has required an environment that encourages innovation, leadership and an entrepreneurial mindset. I'd now like to in, uh, introduce today's speaker. Professor Peter Dawkins has been the Vice-Chancellor and President of Victoria University since January 2011. This follows six years in higher level leadership roles for the Victorian Government and 28 years in the university sector. Professor Dawkins has led the development and implementation of VU's strategic plan in a period of deregulation of tertiary education and of digital disruption. He is a regular contributor to policy debates in the area of education, especially tertiary education. He is leading a transformation agenda at Victoria University that will shape the university between now and 2030. Victoria University positions itself as a university of opportunity and success, supporting the career development of students from diverse countries, cultures, socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. In its research and engagement agenda, Victoria University focuses on applied and transnational research and making a difference to industry, community and public policy. The Vice-Chancellor was also awarded an Order of Australia in the 2017 Queen's Birthday Honours for his outstanding service to tertiary education as an administrator and an academic. And we, as the Australian Cultural Society, are very fortunate to have partnered with Victoria University through the leadership of Professor Dawkins on hosting three uh, iftar dinners, and we look forward to continuing that uh, relationship. So without further ado, please welcome Prof the Vice-Chancellor and President of Victoria University, Professor Peter Dawkins, AO. Well, th thanks very much, Amit. That was a, a wonderful introduction. And uh, I think you've already done a great job in publicising our, our uh, block model. And, and you did enough to c convince me that it's the best thing since sliced bread, I don't know whether I need to say any more, but, um, 
But look, I'd also like to acknowledge the elders, families and forebears of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who were the custodians of this land for many centuries, and we acknowledge that the land on which we meet was the place of age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the Kulin people's living culture had and has a unique role in the life of this region. I would like to thank the Intercultural Society for inviting me to speak today, and we've had a wonderful relationship with, with uh, the Intercultural Society over the last few years, and that's included a number of iftar dinners in the uh, wonderful multicultural place of Footscray, which is our, our home for Victoria University. And, uh, and I was really delighted to receive this invitation to come and talk to you about, the, about revolutionising tertiary education with the, with the VU block model. Um, it's great to have a number of distinguished guests here today, people from industry, people from community, some of my colleagues from Victoria University who are key players in the in implementation of this block model. So I think we can have a great discussion about something that I do firmly believe is revolutionising tertiary education. I do want to um, put our innovation in the context of the university as a culturally diverse institution and uh, I think this is the right place to talk about cultural diversity which in many ways shapes our approach to education at Victoria University. We have probably the most culturally diverse student population of any university in Australia. We're based in the west of Melbourne that's a very culturally diverse uh, uh, region and our student population reflects that too. And we have a very proactive cultural diversity strategy which means that we want to infuse everything we do with the, with the value of the cultural diversity of the university. So I want to say a little bit about that before I go on to the block model because I think those two things are intimately linked. And so, so I think that's broadly what I've just said, that uh, I want to talk about cultural diversity as well as the block model uh, at Victoria University. And it's important, I think, to let you know what our vision is. You mentioned, I mentioned that we are the University of Opportunity and Success. We believe in providing opportunities for a huge diversity of students from very diverse backgrounds to come and be successful in their learning and then in turn in their careers. And we want to create exceptional value for any student from any background. We are a dual sector university, which means we've got vocational education as well as higher education. And we pride ourselves on being able to provide any student who wants to do tertiary education a way of being successful, whether it be through a vocational certificate, a diploma, uh, a degree, a postgraduate qualification. We have that comprehensive tertiary offer to enable any student from any background to be successful. We also want to uplift the communities in which we operate which is especially the west of Melbourne, but not just the west of Melbourne, but we see ourselves having a transformational impact both on our students and on the community that we serve. And just to reinforce the point about our cultural diversity, uh, we have about 40,000 students, uh, more than 14,000 of which are international students, 13,500 roughly first in family to attend university, and about 10,000 from a non-English speaking background. And, uh, and that gives you a sense of the diversity of our student population. And, uh, and there's another, another statistic there. Our students and staff represent over, uh, from over 90 different cultures, speak over 200 different languages. And so we are very proud of being, says they're one of the most culturally diverse universities. It's hard to benchmark this particular thing, but we have a sense that in our student population, we probably are the most culturally diverse in, in Australia. And we have a deliberate cultural diversity uh, strategy and, uh, and we were very proud to win the 2018 Multicultural Business Award. And our strategy involves enriching the lives of students, connecting us uh, all as a community and, and celebrating our cultural diversity. And it has a number of, number of goals, that cultural diversity strategy uh, that cut across our student engagement, our research engagement, our staff engagement and our community engagement 
And each one of those goals has a number of very deliberate actions. We have representatives of the Commonwealth Bank here today and we have a mentoring program with the Commonwealth Bank, another organisation that's very committed to cultural diversity that helps to mentor our culturally diverse student population to help them be successful, which is our aim as a university. And uh, so, um, so I'm not going to read out all of these words, but if you, if you go to the last, the last slide, the last point on that slide, with the diversity of our student cohort comes the diversity in students' needs for a variety of learning and teaching models to be available, to be made available in order for them to be successful. So we, we are very focused on the success of our students and we've got a very student-focused strategy uh, of the university. And we decided um, when we set our current strategic plan for the university for the period 2016 to 2020 that we needed to transform uh, the quality of teaching and learning at Victoria University. We needed to transform our research. We needed to transform the whole organisation because, because we are in a world now since tertiary education became such a, a mass kind of industry and every, any student from any background needs to be involved in tertiary education, that traditional models are ceasing to be relevant and we need to adopt new, mo new models to deal with such a diverse community of students with such diverse needs. And our transformational agenda was underpinned by four big ideas. And the first one is what something I've already talked about, the moral purpose of the of the university, transforming lives and transforming communities. A university focused on its students and its communities. Big idea number two was reconceptualizing tertiary education as a university without boundaries. And that's that's partly about being there for any student from any background. We put no boundaries around the students that we want to support. It's about breaking down boundaries between vocational education and higher education that's been too segmented. Many students need both vocational and higher education. Some of them pathway from vocational education to higher education. There's even more go the other way. Once they've completed a degree, they realise they needed to do some TAFE to, to, to find a useful skill. Uh, to, 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 to get, a, get a good job and use all of the capabilities they've learned through their tertiary education. But also this university without boundaries is about, about being connected with the real world, about being intermingled with industry and with community. And, uh, and so we're a university that is spread across a region, not just on our own campuses, but we're on other people's sites. We're on the We've got the Victoria University with Noble, where we're with the Western Bulldogs. We're, we're at the Sunshine Hospital with Western Health. We've, we're getting industry onto our campuses. John Holland, the Westgate Tunnel Project, coming onto our campus at Werribee. Uh, and, um, and now we're hopeful that the Footscray Hospital will come onto our campus at, at, uh, at Victoria, at Footscray Park as well. And so this is the university without, without boundaries. And then the third thing is about developing 21st century skills and confronting 21st century challenges. And that is probably the, the, the predominant idea behind our block mode teaching because we're in a world in which information is readily available through the internet, uh, for example. And it's not about transmitting information, it's about building capabilities of students to use information and to confront 21st century challenges. And we are particularly focus on building 21st century challenges into our curriculum as well as into our research, things like climate change, things like chronic disease, uh, things like job growth in a, era, in, a, in a region of population growth. How do we, how do we develop those problem solving and entrepreneurial skills in our students to confront 21st century challenges? Big idea number four is that as a university ourselves, we need to be agile to increase our own productivity uh, in order to grow and become more important uh, as, a, as a university for the community. So we're aiming to be agile, dynamic, innovative. Um, and uh, so the title of my talk, Fast and Furious, is, is as much about the world in which this, uh, it's much about how what we're trying to do as an agile university is about the world that the students live in. So in this transformational agenda, um, a a major focus is transforming our teaching and learning. And we have introduced 
the Victoria University block model. And we're lucky in, to have Ian Solomonides who's sitting at, uh, do you want to, if you turn around, you see a gentleman at the back there put his hand up. Ian Solomonides is my vice president for teaching and learning. So I now get nervous about saying what a wonderful pedagogy this is because the real expert's sitting in the back row, but he can tell me whether I get this right or not. Um, so we say it's internationally proven and an Australian first. So it's not that we are the first university in the world to do this. We basically scoured the world. Given these challenges that we're trying to confront as a university to support our students, we scoured the world for what we thought was best practice to support this diverse community of students. And we found a couple of examples in North America where student satisfaction and student engagement in learning is extraordinarily high. One is a university called Quest University, a little university near, near Vancouver. Uh, and, uh, but it's also quite common in Scandinavia, in, in Sweden in particular, this idea of the block model. And, uh, and we'll come to what the block model is at the moment, but probably the most important thing to know about the block model is you study one subject at a time. So get that idea in your mind first, one subject at a time. And, uh, those of you who may possibly, either yourselves or you might have children who are at university at the moment, I don't know if they ever say to you, oh, I've got three assignments due at the end of this week and they're all in different subjects, how am I going to do all of that? Well, that's because they're doing four subjects at a time, most of them. Our students do one subject at a time, so you can begin to have a sense of why that's a good idea. Um, so uh, this year we commenced it for our first year, for our first year's uh, only, um, and as it says on that slide, from semester one, 2019, it will be implemented from second year for second year and beyond, because it's been such an amazing success in first year, we realise that we've got to do it in second, second year and beyond. Why did we start with the first year? We started with the first year because that's the most challenging time for our students, so we're very focused on our students, and the first year is the period of greatest challenge for students, whether they're coming from school or coming from somewhere else. The transition to university is a period when many students actually fall over, at least temporarily. Hopefully they get back on their horse, but many of them actually find first year too tough to deal with because it can be quite an alienating experience. They've got lots of people, teachers that come and go, they go to one lecture, go to another one. They don't really have anyone, they don't necessarily develop friends or get to know staff very well. They, they, they have to be very self-reliant. The shock is too great for many of them and, and the dropout rate too high, the failure rate's too high and we decided that had to change. So we decided to change it first and foremost in first year and we created a college dedicated to our first year students. So, so rather than students going straight into a college of engineering and science or straight into a college of business or a college of law, they go into the first year college where, the, where we hired high quality teachers who are devoted to supporting the first year students to being successful. So that's where we started. And we, as I say, we scoured the world to find the best method of teaching them and we, and we found this, this block model. So there you can see the traditional model of teaching where you would do four subjects at the same time. And then uh, after uh, you know, about uh, 13 weeks, you, you have swap back and then you do four exams at the same time. Uh, a lot of pressure at the end and no real sense necessarily about how well they're going to go until they do those exams. Um, I mean, they will get some feedback during the course, but, but really it's a highly risky strategy <laughs> uh, to ensure the success of students, to leave it to chance at the end of, a, of that when they're doing four subjects at a time and they're going from one lecture to another and so on. So the block model um, has you doing one unit at a time, and then uh, and then you do, then you get assessed within that four week period in that in that subject, and uh, I mean it's it's kind of when you when you see it it's so kind of obvious that you wonder why it isn't more common, but um, and you and you do deep intensive learning. You do nine hours a week with a teacher, and and I can speak as someone of experience of doing this now because I was so so enthusiastic about this idea that Ian came and... You know, Ian, I think I first heard about this... When did you come into my office? About, about a year ago. A bit, a year and a half. <laughs> May, May of last year, Ian said, I've discovered this block model, what do you think? 
And um, within, uh, within a few weeks, I was its leading advocate, apart from Ian himself, in Australia, I think, uh, because we, we had a lot of research evidence about its impact. But I thought, since I am you know, the leader of a university doing this huge transformation, I need to get into the classroom myself and have a go at this. And so I've done one block. I'm a professor of economics, so I did a first year economics course with about 28 students. And you have them for nine hours a week in the class and uh, for four weeks. And it's just a fantastic experience for the teacher as well as the students because you get to know all the students. They actually turn up, incidentally. That's another innovation. So... <laughs> At lots of at universities in general now, after the first week or two, you find that the students don't turn up. So, so the teacher turns up, and there's a video. There's a video camera videoing them, and they give a lecture to the video camera, and then all the students watch them on their computers at home. What kind of a learning experience is that? So, um, so we get they actually turn up to these classes, and they interact with the teacher. They interact with each other. They do problem solving. There's a lot of the learning materials on the web for them. They are expected to read up stuff before they come to class, but when they come to class, they do problem solving, group work, debates, and then we, and then we keep going back and making sure they're learning as they go. And then by the time you get to the test, the, the test at the end of the thing, you can be pretty confident that they're gonna be successful um, if they've lasted the course, and most of them do. And so retention rate is just, has just skyrocketed and the achievement rate has skyrocketed. Um, and alongside the, um, these units, we have complementary activities where, we, where they can go along and learn about um, presentation skills or, or literacy and numeracy skills that they need to help support the learning. And one of the advantages of, of, of teacher getting to know all these students is that they know what additional skills they need and they can, if necessary, send them off to do some complementary activities to help them. With, with the subject. So if you look at you know, a student's timetable, then that would have been typical of the old timetable with uh, lectures and tutorials in different subjects. They're doing four different subjects, lectures dotted around the week, tutorials dotted around the week. Um, many of them have got part-time jobs. Quite tricky to, to find time to work alongside that. Uh, some of them have got family responsibilities. Uh, so it's a sort of a complex type of life. Life's complex enough without us making it harder for them. Whereas this is what they have to do. This is their, their, their attendance regime. Uh, that was actually the, the model I had with my class, Monday, Tuesday and Thursday for three hours. Uh, and many of them then go to complementary activities in the afternoon if they wish, or they go into the library or the learning commons afterwards to do to do more work but that was the act, the only time they actually had to be there and most of them come for all of that time whereas in the other model many of them weren't there for quite a lot of that time but look at all the other time they've got either to fit their their family lives or their working lives as well as their study regime around the around the block model so um so there you go, one unit for four weeks, three days a week, 11 days per block, three to four hours a day, uh, all results finalised by the end of the block. So you get some assessments as you go and then after four weeks you know whether you've passed or failed immediately, within a day of completing the final test. Um, and so a first year student knows after four weeks whether they've already got a subject under their belt and if they haven't, we know that they need some help, but the other thing is because it's a four-week block, they can retake it either in the next block or in the, in, the, in the winter break, and it means that they don't necessarily have to wait another year before they do another whole semester of something that they've they failed. So it enables them to make sure we've got 11 blocks during the year, they've only got to pass eight subjects and they've passed a full-time load um, by, the end of, by the end of the year. So... Um, I think the other thing to say, quite apart from the kind of convenience and rationality of this model, the learning experience is really the, the big thing. It's, it's focusing on one thing at a time, deeply immersing yourself in the subject, but then this collaborative, active, immersive and deep learning. So this group work, this, this being able to discuss things, share, share ideas. They, my, my experience, they start off a little bit shy 
but by the end of the four weeks, they're, they're buzzing as a group and they've got to know each other and they're willing to let you know what they really don't understand. They're willing to tell you when you're talking nonsense and all that kind of thing, or sounding like nonsense. <laughs> Where it's under the old lecture model where you had 300 in the class, they, they, they didn't sort of let you know, no, you've got to go over that again or what's really the story here. So it, it's, it's a fantastic method of, um, of learning. Uh, blended and flexible blended means that those digital resources are incorporated into it, but it's still fundamentally a face-to-face -face learning method. Frequent assessments, uh, formative, that means helping them uh, to know how they're going, summative to tell you how they've gone, timely and impactful feedback. So, um, ah yes, we're now going to show you a little video because you've heard from me. Now, now hear from some of the students who've been doing this first year model about what they think about it. And my technical man is setting it up for us. innovative I've been talking to my friends from other universities and uh, they say that their life their university life in particular is a lot more hectic and crazy than what I personally am experiencing at Victoria University with the first year model it reduces the uh, fact that I can't procrastinate, but it does increase the fact that I have to focus on my degree more, which is really good. There's one, one class to focus on, so you can really commit to that class and, and you know, you can do your, your assigned homework or your assignments in a, in a way that suits you, um, and you're not having to deal with five, six other, other classes at one time. I used to do four subjects at a time, four assignments at a time, and be a lot of coffee field nights and coffee field days trying to get it all done it was, yeah, it was a lot less stressful doing just one at a time rather than four at once. It's way easier to make friends this way because the classrooms are quite small too and with the way um, the classrooms are very interactive, uh, you're constantly like discussing with other people. Um, even just the way the content has been created, you kind of have to talk to people and make friends. I'm there three days a week, three hours each day, and it's uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Definitely easier, because in high school you're obviously juggling, juggling a lot more subjects and you're there a lot more often, but with the first year model, um, yeah, you're focusing on one thing at a time, and so yeah, it's a lot more easy to manage it all. So, uh, you know, that, that, that they weren't kind of a um, specially selected group who we knew were enjoying it. It's just amazing how prevalent that response is. So one of my motivations for going to the classroom was to find out whether the students who'd been introduced to me, who were saying how wonderful it was, whether that was the, the common response from, it, from everyone. And so, um, so I, I took the opportunity to, make, to ask all of the students in my class you know how they were how they were enjoying it, and the vast majority saw it as a great model. Several of them actually had failed economics, the subject I was teaching them under the old model, and were retaking it, and um, and so they were able to comp compare it, and they said how much better it was to focus, to really get on top of the concepts that you know are quite challenging in a subject like economics, but if you deeply immerse them in it for four weeks in time, then they. They do get on top of it. Oh, so there's another pic. That's me teaching my class. You can see it's quite a culturally diverse group, which is another of the exciting things about this learning experience at Victoria University. So when we were, when we were talking about economics, when we were talking about money, when we were talking about unemployment, um, some of these people came from other countries. 
we've got quite a lot of refugees at Victoria University whose experience in where they came from, of the economy they came from, is very different from the economy they're now in. Some of their international students. Uh, so we were able to have quite a deep and rich discussion about different types of economies, different types of markets, uh, and so on. And um, uh, Tim Dodd, who was the journalist there, I got him, that's him standing next to me, to come and help me teach the class. And uh, I think he had quite a lot of fun. And uh, the graph on the left-hand side is what's happened to student retention. So you can see that in the, in the old model, that blue line is all those students dropping out in the beginning of in that first semester. That's the period when dropouts are most significant, whereas you can see now they're not dropping out. They're hanging in there. And this data is just so exciting. I thought that the data would move, but I've been amazed by how much it has moved. There's another example of what's happened. You know, the fails have just reduced dramatically and the high distinctions and distinctions have gone up. And this is, this is teaching to a standard, so we've made sure our standards remain the same. Uh, we don't just believe in a normal distribution. You don't just take the top 10% and give them a distinction, the bottom 10% and make them fail. You've got to achieve a standard. And this is what's happening against the standards. We're getting far more high distinction the distinctions and far fewer fails. And um, there you can see increased Student retention, increased student success, highest rate of distinctions, high distinctions, pass rates going up, student satisfaction going up, engagement and attendance going up. And yeah, we, we're delighted to be winning awards for this. And that's the VU block model. So um, thank you for listening.